Derek Codal is engaged in the intersection between language, linguistics, and education. So that means the question of education for who? So many groups, many different people of all ages are really interested in learning more about this intersection. And today we've heard about the work in the Pacific from Nick and Janet and Alpheus. We've heard about work with indigenous communities, both in the session that Felicity chaired and also in the more recent panel discussion. Now, from the start of COVID, we set up an education subcommittee, and this kind of acted as a clearinghouse for ideas and suggestions and promotion for some kinds of education work. So what we've done in this panel is to ask four people who've got different backgrounds to talk about four projects with general audiences. Um, I'll introduce each of them in turn. They'll each speak for five minutes about their project. And then if you've got particular questions about their project there and then, there'll be a chance for a roving microphone for you to ask a question. And then we'll have a panel discussion, and then we'll throw it open for general discussion. So uh, our first speaker is, our first panel discussant is John Mansfield. He was a Codal postdoctoral fellow from the start, and he's now working at the University of Melbourne as a senior lecturer. And he's going to talk about a project which is really close to the heart of the Education Committee, and that's the Codal Sun School which are aimed at researchers and university students. So, over to you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. So, we've heard this morning about how CODAL has aimed to progress linguistics and the science of language and connections between that to uh, language-speaking communities. But if we want to be at that forefront and move things forward, as I think Nick already mentioned, What's the point if we're not bringing along with us the next generation who are coming through? People who are coming through as students of linguistics and languages. So, Kogel organized during the course of its, uh, of its time several summer schools, generally held in about December each year. And these were set up so that that latest research can be shared with people coming through and not just sharing research and scholarship, but actually also sharing time and space between people who are working researchers and lecturers and people who are still studying. So not just sharing the ideas, but also sitting down together, having lunch together, having drinks together afterwards, even staying within the same place for a few days, right? So also building actual you know, personal connections too. So, I was involved in 2016 when the summer school was held at the University of Melbourne. I coordinated that with a lot of help from other people at the University of Melbourne. Thank you to those who are here. Um, and this edition in particular was held over four days. It was held on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Thursday and a Friday. I think we got a hint from previous iterations that it was a great idea to actually build in a kind of break day in the middle because these events, these summer schools, they're very intellectually and socially intensive for people. People find them stimulating and exhausting. So hint, try and build in a bit of break time as well. And over these four days, people could take courses in advanced and specific areas of language research. So the kind of things that they generally don't get in their other language, uh, linguistic studies. So for example, they could take a specialist course in Papuan languages they might not have heard about before. They could take specialist courses in particular statistical methods that have been applied in linguistics. Um, these courses that were particularly offering statistical and other technical, uh, other kind of techniques were very, very popular and students showed great appreciation for that. So we have, 160 attendees at the 2016 event, so it's very popular. Who are those people? There's a kind of a core group. The largest part of that is PhD students and master's students. So people are taking that step up from undergraduate linguistics to wanting to make it perhaps a more serious part of their life. 
But besides them, there are several other, so you also have honours and undergraduate students. Some of the keen ones want to take this step and do this summer school. And then you also have people who are not involved in a university. So there's also a smaller group of people from just other professions, uh, indigenous community members, people working in language centres. Some people from these other areas also want to get involved. So the perfect summer school is managing to create this mix where people from these different backgrounds and different kind of levels of study are all finding something that they're interested in and being able to connect with each other in those shared spaces at the same time. Um, I actually ran into Edie Ma the other day from uh, Itawonga Language Centre, who I hadn't seen since 2016, but she, as soon as I mentioned who I was and worked at the University of Melbourne, she's like, right, you were the one there for that, uh, that summer school back in 2016, which she had actually had very great memories of. Um, so that's very encouraging to hear because I think that's the real challenge of these summer schools to get the right balance for you know people who are doing a PhD in linguistics have different kinds of interests from people who work in a language centre on the west coast of Australia. Um, so just to summarise, I think the best thing about uh, these summer schools is making them inclusive, making them low cost. Having a well-funded institution like CODAL allows you to then subsidise it and make it like that so there aren't barriers to involvement. And breaking down the kinds of stratification we have. So these are all people who share an intense and passionate interest in language. They want to learn more. They want to learn technical skills. Here's a way to put them together and give them a really nice shared experience and probably make new friends and colleagues at the same time. Thanks, Jim. Now, over to you guys. Um, you, many of you have been at some schools. Any comments, reflections, or questions for John? And Ruben is taking the mic around. Naturally, way up at the back. <laughs> I don't really remember what summer school I went to, but it's very early. Janet, do you remember which one you sent me to? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Sydney, so maybe it was 2015. Um, and I am psych by trade, working with Janet in the School of Engineering, so I was not a linguist, and I was a brand new PhD student, but I still got a ton of stuff out of the summer school. Uh, we are an interdisciplinary centre, and as much as that first, I think it was the first summer school, maybe the second, I don't know, um, as much as it was a bit chaotic, um, and very confusing for me to like have to delve into the linguistic stuff. As a Cobal PhD who isn't a linguist, that was incredibly valuable, and I carried a lot of that learning through all of my PhD. So, just a comment to say it's fantastic. No, thanks for raising it, uh, Chris. Christian. Kristen, right. I remember meeting at the summer school probably. So actually another whole dimension I forgot to mention. So I looked at a bit of the breakdown of who attended, and the breakdown was in terms of like, you know, what level of study they're at, or if they're a working academic, or if they're from outside academia. But actually this whole other dimension is, it's not just linguists, right? As, as you point out. So, and we actually didn't really track that when we were tracking who was attending. So that would be a great idea for future summer schools to also keep in mind people who are coming from other uh, scholarly disciplines. I'm, I'm actually wondering whether Janet Wiles might like to comment on this because I remember you as being instrumental in saying that we have to open it up, we have to explain our disciplines to each other. I'm not quite sure why I say it this way, I'm a tech person um, who's confused by a lot of the language linguistics. And I think the summer schools were fantastic from right at the beginning. It was very hard, as Kristen said, to understand what was going on. If you didn't do first year linguistics, you couldn't understand the first thing. And as the centre's gone on, I think we have begun to talk better across the disciplines and to be able to explain the simplest things without thinking, who is this person? Why don't they know first year? Um, so I think the summer schools were a huge part of that and they're a huge part of forming interdisciplinary links, so tying in with the um, TICS, I think a lot of our TICS was formed either through the summer schools or through the, the COVID events. So I think everything that, that happened within the centre to bring disciplines together and have those conversations. Thank you. Um, well, we might move on to our next 
presentation now. Um, Eleanor Shear is going to talk about the Codal Summer Scholar Program, or rather various universities had summer scholar programs which were then funded by Codal. Uh, this is aimed at university undergrad and coursework students. Eleanor is speaking from her own experience as a summer scholar and now as a PhD with Catherine Travis, almost about to speak, um, she's acted as a mentor for summer scholars. Thanks Jane. Um, so yes, I'm a huge fan of the Sun Scholars program. Um, if only because on a purely selfish level, I don't think I would have made it to my PhD program without it. Maybe I would, but it was really quite instrumental in entering that program. Um, for those who aren't so familiar with it, the Sun Scholars program is a program that's run over the sort of summer teaching break. I think it's like eight weeks, maybe, um, with a break for Christmas um, and years in between, and students sort of work on a research project um, for that extended period and when I did it in pre-COVID time so at that time um, the cost of accommodation was covered and we saved it um, student accommodation at ANU and you were given a small stipend as well I believe um, but what was also quite good about the program was that it wasn't just linguistics so I think the Sun Scholars program at ANU at least predates CODAL and so most of the Sun Scholars were from maths, physics and chemistry and we were the uh, weirdos from humanities and social sciences and I remember like, we were in a habit of the linguistics and we had six or seven of us yeah seven um, we would do like the crossword in the morning at breakfast and got the, the physicists did not know what to do with us um, and I thought it was so weird but it was really, really excellent. And I think in you know, COVID times, unfortunately, it had to be online, but there was still you know, a range of students coming from a range of backgrounds. Um, but again, the kind of benefit of CODAL was that it enabled linguists to participate in such a good program. Um, because I think there are many other disciplines that would like to have something like that, but just are not able to fund them. Um, and so, you know, I can't really speak for the CODAL side of motivation for the program, but in terms of um, building a community of researchers and training the next generation, I think this Unscaled program is quite instrumental to that as part of it. Um, and I think, again, from a mostly personal, but I think it can be more generalized, like the value of the program, A, it goes both, both ways, I think, um, because researchers at CODAL get a whole bunch of research assistants to do work on research for them for eight weeks and that's really beneficial obviously time is money um, and they do good work and they progress projects um, to a remarkable extent in the amount of time that they have I think um, especially when I was mentoring them recently I was astonished by what um, those young scholars achieved in the time that they had um, but then for the students who are participating there's a huge range of like, quite incredible benefits that I've been sort of realized when I was actively thinking about preparing for this presentation. Um, I think the main one is sort of, we were talking about with the summer schools is kind of the accessibility of the program. Um, because you get a very accessible introduction, A, to larger linguistic research. Um, I know at ANU, the new PhD students, like they get kind of some introduction to larger scale projects, but I think definitely in my undergrad that was not the case. I was barely, didn't really have much introduction to research until honors. Um, and I think the Summer Scholars Program gives you a direct sort of introduction in a sort of much lower stress environment into sort of how these projects work and developing workflows and processing data, like what do we do in these research projects and that's quite a rare experience I think to have outside of honours or at least that was kind of my um, undergraduate experience. Um, and you also get a wonderful accessible introduction to a lovely academic community of linguists, but also people from other disciplines. Um, again, I think in my undergraduate, I found academics pretty intimidating um, a little bit, or at least I didn't have um, that kind of introduction, that like I couldn't interact with them in that sort of um, way, whereas you, when you sort of do these projects and you're working with academics on their research, you sort of get much more of a friendly um, introduction to it and you go to attend summer schools and you have conferences and you get that practice of doing presentations and then processing data. 
Um, and finally, very practically, you acquire new technical skills in a fairly low pressure environment. So that's it's where I was introduced to Elan, I was introduced to LabCat, to Flex, to Elvis, like all of those things. Like I learned about them through the Summer Skills program and through the Summer School. Um, and I think, yeah, that's just such an immense value. So even if for those who don't continue, um, I mean, I've attended the um, Summer Skills and PhD pipeline because quite a few of us go on to do PhDs either at ANU or other institutions, or to go on to do honors. Um, whether or not you do follow that pipeline, you sort of walk away with these skills and connections and knowledge that I think is incredibly valuable. Thank you very much. Now we've got both former summer scholars in the audience, and also both Felicity and Caroline have had summer scholar programs at their universities. So open to you guys for any extra comments or questions. Uh, yeah, I'm also a big beneficiary of summer scholars and the summer schools. Um, they're both kind of the main things that got me out of like just doing undergrad and doing some linguistics to actually, you know, seeing how it all works and getting really into it. Um, I'm curious, I don't know if you would know Eleanor, but anyone else as well, um, what the kind of ideas for continuing this stuff are uh, post COVID? I have no knowledge or power. <laughs> um, <laughs> I strongly support it. <laughs> I don't know if you know something, Jane. Uh, well, the Australian Linguistic Society has been very impressed. Oh, sorry. That's the Institute. Oops. Sorry. Um, the Australian Signals Directorate has been funding the scholarships, at, some of the scholarships at ANU. We had a fantastic crop of applicants this year, more than we've ever had before. 42 applicants from about eight different universities. University of Melbourne, I'd have to say, is a winner, but we've 13 applicants. Um, so clearly there's demand there. And our hope is that other universities can make use of this demand to say, well, hey, what about, you know, am I university funding it? But I also hope, uh, we also hope that we can talk to the Australian Signals Directorate about further funding as well. Um, I think actually this is a really nice time to thank um, the summer research students like Eleanor, the many, many wonderful students, some of whom are in the audience that I've had from UQ. Um, the work that you've done um, with us on projects and um, more distantly with uh, particularly um, a lot of the projects with Indigenous colleagues have really lifted the research that the Colonel's done and lifted um, a lot of community work. So um, Carolyn was uh, showing, for instance, a lot of the e-dictionaries that we've produced um, in recent times, a lot of that work was done by you guys. Um, there are other um, corpora online. There um, have been uh, certainly projects that I've run that I'll talk about tomorrow, population genetics projects that just could not have been done uh, without all of you and your enthusiasm and hard work. And it's so fantastic to see some of you doing PhD programs, some of you um, being community linguists in language centres um, and just the, all of the sorts of things that you've taken from those programs out into the community and the work you're doing now. for a general audience. 
This grew from a kernel of an idea that we had in early 2015 when we were at one of those early CODAL events, and we got to talking about how we thought it was really unfair that rural students in high schools um, across rural Australia often missed out on the kind of fun extension activities that were happening on university campuses around Australia and also were really underrepresented in things like, say, National Olympiads, such as Oslo, the Linguistics Olympiad. And so we took the golden opportunity that was afforded by CODAL, the early days of TIG, again, um, and we pitched the idea of gathering together a bunch of very enthusiastic linguistic nerds, hitting the road from classrooms in uh, rural Australia. And look, I think at that point, we were pretty sure that we would just be so cool that linguistics, you know, that rural students would just be lining up for linguistics courses immediately. It didn't quite pan out like that, but we had a lot of enthusiasm and we also brought along a lot of swag, which really helped. Um, our goal um, since the start has been to enhance the public understanding of the study of language as a varied and exciting scientific endeavour and just to raise the profile of linguistics and of linguists as well in Australia more generally. So when the roadshow comes to town, what happens is that we're there for a few days, usually in the region. We run a bunch of hands-on workshops for students um, in high schools. We gear the roadshow towards year 7 to 10 for a few reasons. We have a sense that um, students within that age group are more perhaps open to new ideas, um, and more open to positive messages about linguistic diversity and linguistic variation. And we wanted to get it early, so exposure to the idea of linguistics, hopefully to later pay off into people being interested in linguistics careers and language related careers. Our indirect audience was always teachers as well, so the teachers were often in the room when we were delivering the workshops. Um, and that was really great for a few reasons. We knew that we could probably be a positive influence on them also, and their understanding of linguistics and the profile of linguists. But we also knew that we needed them on board to reinforce the messages after we left town and to also access our bank of resources for classroom use later on. Um, the roadshow has been structured around three quite simple but hopefully powerful messages. So the first is linguistic diversity at the global level. The second has to do with the Australian linguistic landscape, taking in traditional Aboriginal languages, newer contact varieties like Creole, migrant languages, range of Aboriginal Englishes and so on. And the third had to do with variation within Australian English. Um, and we really wanted students to take those messages and to be able to apply them to their own daily, everyday experiences with language. We wove those messages across several activities. So there was a short, uh, fairly dynamic talk with some fun visuals. You can see us, Rosie and myself delivering it just here. Um, there was then a set of hands-on activities that students would rotate around. Um, so there's a few of those. You can see some pictures here. One included an activity on linguistic, exploring linguistic variation um, within Australian English using some interactive maps that we had made. You can see a screenshot from those pictures just there. They also got, as part of that activity, to choose a badge to wear, depending on their stance on the great potato cake versus scallop versus fritter wars. Um, so that was fun, um, and a very important thing was that they got to get, take home with them a pretty hefty show bag with a whole bunch of great stuff, so including a fridge magnet of Aboriginal languages, a chatterbox with linguistic themed questions, um, a paper larynx that they could make at home, and these functioned as kind of like sleeper agents, so we hoped that they would sort of make their way onto fridges and coffee tables around the community so conversations would Continue. We also left them with a link to our website, lingroadshow.com, so they could follow up with resources and so on. So the roadshow, I think, has been a really great success. Um, we certainly have positive feedback from students and teachers who report getting lots out of it and that those conversations did continue. Um, the show bags were a particular hit, and the roadshow content has sort of found its way into all sorts of corners. It's turned up on the VC English language exam, um, and it spawned a bunch of outcomes that have led to much wider community engagement. So, for example, the maps that we made, which were actually just part of a really small local activity, have now had more than 3 million views online and have fed into PhD research and various things. Um, finally, I'm really happy to say that in the post-Codal era, um, there'll be some ongoing financial support. 
um, across a few Australian institutions, which is wonderful. The website's going to get a bit of a facelift, so that'll facelift, so that'll be a major port of call for accessing our research sources. And all those resources are going to be up there and open access for anyone across Australia to be able to use them, deliver them to much more um, diverse audiences and for diverse purposes. And so it's our hope that. It'll inspire uh, a long tradition of linguistics nerds getting out there on the road to talk to young people about language. Thank you. And now, well, <laughs> also over to you for any comments or questions for Jewel about it. The website is amazing. Who says to Peter Frieda? <laughs> I'll have to head on to our maps to find the answer to that tantalising question. And the maps are really fascinating. If you head on to our, um, onto our website or look up Maps Linguistic Roadshow, you'll see some really fascinating boundaries that sometimes map along with state lines and sometimes don't, but really great teaching resources to talk about how variation patterns, but also how state identity comes into it and all that sort of stuff. What do you say? Potato skull at I'll get you a patch line. <laughs> Um, I'd just like to say, um, you know, to concur with the, the, um, the brilliance of the website and I hope I'm responsible for, I don't know, I think maybe a million of years um, because I've certainly included the link in all the teaching you know, that I've ever, ever done and it's just been the most amazing um, resource. Uh, the whole team, whatever, you know, whether it's you know, Team Court or Team Potato Scholar or whatever, um, just really captures the, uh, the attention of people in such a fabulous way. I just think it was marvellous what you did there. Thanks, Denise. Well, thank you. And we'll move on to our next, our final speaker, Anne-Marie Morgan. So Anne-Marie has been a key member of our advisory board. Uh, she's been working at James Cook University as Dean of the College of Arts, Society and Education and she's now moving to the University of South Australia as the Dean of Programs in the Academic Unit of Education Futures. You have the longest title. <laughs> <laughs> so she's a long time member of AFMLTA which is the peak body for school language teaching in Australia. And as an executive member of AFMLTA, she's been instrumental in making sure that the voices of Indigenous language teachers are heard in the AFMLTA. And she's going to talk to us about another key coding project, the Patchy Doors Award, a project aimed at language teachers. Thank you, Jane. Uh, yes, so the Patchy Doors Award, which most of you will, will know about, um, uh, it has been running since 2015 um, and it honours the work of teachers of languages, of outstanding achievements in, in teaching language and making that visible to a, a wider audience. Um, the, uh, was, so it was established in 2015 um, and administration of the ward uh, is now going to pass on to the AFMLTA and LC now, which is the Languages and Cultures Network of Australian Universities. Um, uh, they, both of those organisations have also co-sponsored uh, the event um, uh, since its inception, so it's always been a, a collaborative recognition. The name of the award commemorates uh, the earliest documented language education partnership in Australia's history between the young Indigenous woman uh, Pachi Gorang, um, and uh, Lieutenant William Dawes. Their close and humane relationship resulted not only in, uh, in an exceptional mastery of the Sydney language by Dawes, but in a relationship of cross-cultural understanding that's been all too rare in Australia's history. So there have been four rounds uh, of the award uh, in, the, in the life of uh, the CODAL project. In 2015, the, the winner of the award was Sarah Payne from Canberra Grammar School. Um, and the, one of the things that's unique about this award is that uh, the nominations come from students or former students of their teachers. And she was nominated by a previous student, Derek Bailey, uh, and she was a teacher of French and German. There's a jury um, or committee that, that's set up to, uh, to judge these um, applications. Um, and uh, make the awards 
and they're a mixture of people from across professional associations, education and language academics uh, and uh, researchers uh, in the area. And once we had one award, the subsequent uh, awards always had a previous uh, winner on the, on the jury as well. So in that first round, um, uh, there were Leah Tedesco, uh, Kylie Farmer, John Hajek, Tim McNamara and Carol Stott. In 2017, uh, the winner was uh, 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 John Jiakon, who teaches Gamilaroi at the Australian National University and the University of Sydney. And he was nominated by a previous ANU student, Jackie McLean. Um, the committee that year um, was still led by Leah Tedesco. Uh, I was on that committee. Jean Fornasario uh, from uh, LC Now, Leslie Harbin, Michael Christie, and the previous winner, Sarah Payne. In 2019, uh, two teachers of Australian Indigenous languages were joint winners. Uh, Sophia Mung, a Gita woman from East Kimberley in Western Australia, and brother Stephen Morelli, a Christian brother. Sophia was nominated by a previous student, uh, Anna Crane. She teaches Gita. Uh, Stephen was nominated by Gary Williams, uh, uh, an elder uh, of the language. And uh, Stephen teaches Kambayi. Um, the committee that year was me, Jean Bonasario, Leslie Harbin, Michael Christie, and the previous winner, John Jarkon. In 2021, there were three recipients um, acknowledged. We kept adding them in. Um, <laughs> the jury kept going back to um, the total um, committee of management and saying, is it all right if we have more than one winner? Uh, because there were so many uh, wonderful entries. So three were honoured in 2021. Um, uh, Sharon Gregory, uh, Maria Lopresti, and the staff of the Graduate Certificate in Wiradjuri Language, Culture and Heritage at Charles Sturt University. So Sharon teaches Noongar and was nominated by the local uh, Noongar language group. Maria teaches Italian and was nominated by students at Aquinas College. And the, um, the Wiradjuri uh, uh, group from Charles Sturt University uh, were nominated by a student uh, named Elaine and a very similar committee uh, and we had Stephen Morelli on there as a previous winner as well. So into the future, uh, AFMLGA and LC now will continue to, uh, to run the award um, and the, the handing on of that responsibility is uh, an important uh, aspect of COLA moving on and the, the idea of uh, recognising uh, the importance of teaching of languages uh, now embedded in these professional associations for people who, who know and promote the work of teachers of languages and the critical work they do. Elsie um, Now and AFMLJ are very mutually supportive and have been working with, with each other since Elsie Now uh, began. The same conditions will apply for the award, um, but one of the reflections that the juries had is that Sometimes there's variable detail in the applications because they're nominations by students and sometimes those uh, students have less support to develop their application than others. So we're looking at a way to, to make that um, more uh, consistent. Um, in, and uh, we will get to talking about where we're going with this as well in relation to the, the wider scene and, and um, uh, I want to talk about some of the other work of the AFMTA uh, with some commissioned work from the Australian Government on developing the National Plan and Strategy, which uh, leads on from uh, the, the previous panel's uh, discussion. So I think I can uh, probably answer some questions on that as well. Thank you. Now, comments or questions for Anne-Marie? Uh, thanks very much. I always thought this was uh, a great thing that CODAL was making possible to acknowledge the hard work that some of these people have been doing for years and years. What is the thing that you see in people's applications that indicates that these people are great teachers? Uh, yeah, absolutely every one of them said it was a life-changing event for them, that it provided them with access to 
to a new understanding of uh, the cultures of people and language and the way language works uh, with their first languages as well as uh, these additional languages. Um, and that uh, it was the, the dedication and commitment, uh, usually well above and beyond what you might expect of, uh, of, of a teacher in any teaching context, that, um, that influenced their lives forever. So um, that was what we saw in, in each of the applications consistently, which is probably a surprise. Well, thank you, Anne-Marie, and uh, thank you and your fellow judges for all the work you put in on this. So, thank you. <laughs> now, we've got uh, a few minutes for discussion, but I'd first like to start by asking the panellists to think not now on what we have achieved, but on the future. So. What new directions do you see in language, linguistics and education? You know, perhaps it's in the direction of policy. Perhaps it's in some particular project. Over to you. And maybe I'll start with you, John. Thanks, Jane. Thanks for the Dorothy Dix on the policy there. <laughs> so, we've been talking here in this session about language education. And in the last session, Denise was talking about policy. and. Um, there's also a really important connection there that CODAL supported, especially just in recent times, with uh, thinking about language policy, particularly for Australian Indigenous languages, and how to connect those policy makers up with the hard-working people on the ground in communities and the advocates from communities around Australia. So some of those people are in the room right now, um, Jenny wasn't here, but she's just left. I see Mel over there, and there's a few others around. Um, so Kernel supported two very important things this year, one of which was a really powerful meeting in the top end between a bunch of language advocates from those communities to think about um, what do they want from language policy in the future as we go into this decade of uh, international decade of Indigenous languages. And then just this week, there's been a further policy symposium on a national level, again, partly supported by hurdle with people coming from communities all over Australia and being put in the same room as policymakers and politicians. So um, Denise mentioned that, I think other people have mentioned this morning, there does seem to be a lot of uh, energy in this area at the moment and probably some grounds for hope that things are moving in the right direction. So. Yeah, um, it's, a, it would, it's been great to have been able to support some of these things and I hope there will be further support for there's lots of people in this room who have really important input to this kind of policy and a bit of like resource and funding and stuff is basically all it needs to get those people together and be able to give them a channel to talk to the, the policy makers and the politicians. I'll, I'll just add to that that some of the uh, public servants in the room <coughs> said that they feel that now there's a change and that there's a lot more political will for actually doing something about languages, in particular Indigenous languages. They did, however, say budget problems. But you know, at least they say this is, this is really a major, this, this is, there's been a big change, that the government is much, much more interested in languages now. So, are, are there any questions or comments for John before we move on? Annika? What is the event this week? Oh, sorry, there was an event on Monday. Uh, there was an Indigenous uh, Languages Symposium organised by IANSIS and um, with sponsorship from COVID. I'll move on to Anne-Marie, the future. Um, I agree there is a, a momentum that's, uh, that's happening, especially for Indigenous languages, uh, but also for um, there is an appetite uh, towards uh, multilingualism and plurilingualism um, uh, from our politicians and uh, in, at a policy level and at um, a jurisdictional level in terms of uh, education. 
um, to the extent that um, the Australian Government commissioned the AFMLTA to do a project to develop a national plan and strategy for languages education, you might call that a, a policy uh, as well. We've just completed that work, but with the change of government, that work's been uh, passed on to the government and we're still waiting for a, a, a response back from it. But there were two research projects embedded in that. One looked at provision and participation of languages education, and the other looked at the history of policies, of, of practices, of approaches, uh, international examples, and then developed through a very collaborative process involving um, many teachers and uh, working with the uh, First Languages Australia and Community Languages Australia. Um, there is a, a, a plan that has been um, developed and we're looking to socialise really soon, as soon as the, the government. We can talk about it, but we, we can't give you a published um, uh, version of it at the moment. So um, the discussion earlier was very interesting from the previous panel about the same kinds of, of issues that, uh, that were, were being raised about this appetite, about there is absolutely a moment to, to improve what we do um, in uh, teaching languages at a national level across the full lifespan um, from, from birth. So it's not, it, it, even though the Commission was around languages education, um, we took it from birth through to um, old age. Um, and uh, so our, our plan encompasses that, that whole period and uh, really promotes uh, home and first languages in the first instance and then two additional languages uh, that one way or another um, and then uh, uh, how that extends into um, the beyond school as well. So um, there is a lot of work in this area and I, I really do hope the government will uh, honour this and take it up. Um, and included in that are some plans around how to staff it and the benefits and the literacy benefits and you know all the things that are the, the triggers that seem to um, be important for, for education jurisdictions. Questions or comments for Anne Marie? In a way, this is a question following on from Danielle's question to you earlier on. So when we started the Pachi Doors Award, uh, one of the reasons, apart from honouring uh, great teachers, was just to have a sort of basket to catch insights about what makes language teaching really work yeah. in a way that stepped outside all the sort of doctrines and pedagogical certainties. Mm. And with the hope that those would find their way back into the training of the next generation of language teachers. Um, is there any evidence that that sort of thing is happening or, or what do you see as the messages that are coming through in terms of, of people who have been recipients of that award uh, giving insights into you know, what their secrets are as a language teacher and, and whether those things that new teachers can, can pick up? Um, there's been a, a certainly increased visibility that, that's come from it. So the uh, awards are presented at um, AFMLTA conferences and uh, LC Now Colloquia, and where there is a you know a very large number of uh, of languages teachers um, at schools and universities, and many of whom are early career who come to, to those conferences. So. There's, there's been evidence of, of what wonderful teaching can look like and, and feel like for both the teachers and the, and the students. So um, it, it's there in, in that form. Um, I think we can probably do more with, with those results um, uh, and encourage winners and nominators to, uh, to write more about why they've done this, so yeah, we look to to find ways to um, to ex extend the reach of that work because it absolutely is is to do that, not just to honour it, but to make it visible and make it attractive to to others um, who might want to follow in those um, footsteps. Uh, 
Um, and Marie, thanks for speaking on the teaching element today. Um, I just wondered, with that commissioned work, um, where, it's, where do sort of researchers and universities sit in relation to the proposals in that um, strategy, and particularly teacher education and technology? I'm curious about that. Um, uh, it's not specifically focused on research, it's, it's focused on teaching. Um, uh, it definitely includes university um, teaching um, and there, there are recommendations around um, technologies um, within um, the set of uh, goals and recommendations um, and there are a couple of the recommendations are around establishing a national body and an advisory board that sits across all the states and territories so that it is current, we do have uh, regular data collection, we, we can look at how to resource and um, upgrade the resources um, with both technologies and teaching materials. So there, there are, um, research, and, and that body would also be responsible for research on languages teaching too. So it, it's in there, but it's not a major focus. It's really exciting to hear that these plans are being developed through the government and he's trying to get some of that language um, policy into um, just into action. And I wanted to ask um, if you could add to what Carla has um, already described with the promoting first and home languages in the early years, if that was included in your plan, if you had any other um, sort of policy recommendations or how, how that comes across in a plan like that. Um, and also, if you have time to talk about the primary school, you mentioned learning two languages, and um, that's a primary school thing, and sort of what uh, what parameters you are proposing is best for children in that regard. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely, definitely, the early years is, is promoted. And that, uh, I'm working on another project, an ARC project, that looks at success criteria in early years programs, and. We've not been able to collect data in the last two years, but we're, we're catching up on that now. And we've already developed what we think is a, is a good set of, of criteria for what works. And what works, absolutely, is bilingual programs in, in the early years. And as Paula said, as much use at home as possible and support um, and, and real tangible support um, for uh, <coughs> languages in communities, whatever communities they are, and whatever languages um, they, they speak. So that's that bit. Um, the, the, the first plus one um, is in the, is the primary years, um, so F, F being the foundation here is a consistent name, uh, through to year six. And one of the, the very uh, key recommendations is a um, a standard, a, a quality standard that talks about how much time a week there needs to be, uh, how frequent the lessons need to be, um, what qualifications teachers need, you know, how to resource technologies, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So we have a standard that we say must be met um, to actually achieve this plan. So if if you have that in that uh, in the first primary years, and then the second language, second plus one, um, uh, happens uh, from year seven to year ten, and similarly with a, with a quality standard of uh, what, what that can mean. It's not uh, impossible that the same language could be done in both of those, but the the opportunity for a full and uh, meaningful um, learning opportunity encapsulated in those two ways. And that that's not so scary for the schools to think they have to take on two languages, you know, as well as um, whatever else is, is happening in the school. Um, but it also allows us to separate the, the curricular and the curricular approaches to what's more suitable for primary years and what's more suitable for that down the middle um, uh, years age group. So, and then there's the third plus, so it's home languages, plus one, primary, plus one, secondary, early secondary, plus, plus, it's the last one, 
which is the year 11, 12 university and after um, form of education. We have one last question. Uh, yeah, I think you've um, partly sort of answered the question that I had, but it was, it was really around, um, you know, this whole idea of Indigenous languages and endangered languages and and you know, you've spoken about teaching within schools and improving resources within schools and targeting juniors through to senior sort of levels. Um, but I guess what I'm sort of wondering is that you know we've got a long history of loads subjects being taught within schools, and probably nearly everybody in the room has probably done some sort of load subject within their lifetime. But very, very little and very rarely do people go on to speak that language following school. The complexity is with Indigenous languages is that you're wanting to build up a base of Indigenous speakers where there is no base in many instances. And so that you're looking at, at wider sort of resources and programs, not just within the school, but outside of the school and not just with young people, but with with all the people as well. I'm just wondering whether you can sort of talk about that and where you see your program fitting in with that. Yeah, we don't want to be too prescriptive about that, but we have said that that work must uh, include communities that, uh, and that that work grows like that some of the languages and programs in Indigenous communities we've heard about today um, with resources to support that in, in exactly the way that um, has been described of, of growing the community, learning the language, revitalising the language. Um, so there should be capacity to do that and, and there, there are very specific goals that say that we have to provide the support to the communities to do that. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And now for future, Ellen. Um, I don't have huge amount to say, aside from the fact that in my ideal future, the Summer Scholars Program would keep going and would continue to grow. Um, I think probably moving forward, COVID has done such a good job of grounding sort of its research and its research questions in sort of interdisciplinary work. And I think it would be quite valuable for researchers who are still very much at their early stage, sort of being equipped with the skills to talk to um, other students, but also other researchers from other areas that they're not so familiar with or don't have so much training with. And even if they're not necessarily gaining specific skills in those eight weeks, but just sort of learning how to communicate and how to negotiate and how to um, work towards potentially producing research, which I think would be extremely valuable because I think that's how a lot of research works nowadays. Um, so I think that would be quite valuable and maybe bringing in students from a wider range of backgrounds into the Summer Scholars Program, like most of the ones, at least when I did it, were from a linguistics background, and so maybe there are students from education who may have something to bring to the table, or sociology or anthropology. Um, and I think that would be very cool, and getting those sort of more disciplines to talk to one another into the future, in, in my ideal world. Um, and last comment on the future? Sure. Yes, that's a big ask. Um, oh, well, very briefly, because I know we're, we're nearly out of time, and just picking up on some stuff that Anne-Marie said, I guess, following on from the Roadshow, I'd really advocate for, in the future, thinking about building stronger connections between researchers and school teachers. I think school teachers have a uh, real capacity to be our allies in um, getting the good word out about linguistic research and research more generally, but also, from some of our experiences, um, with the Roadshow can, in some cases, be working actively against us. And so, you know, thinking about the ways that we can um, get this research into classrooms. And for one example could be the Roadshow has actually been used as PD for teachers. We found, without us planning to do it, schools were sending their teachers along to the workshop as PD for them. And so I think there's definitely an appetite out there for to get this stuff in front of teachers, to get them connecting with it and bringing that into the classroom. I think there's a huge richness of resources out there. We've got some experience working with the 50 Words Project and we're hearing about fantastic resources that can be brought into the classroom, put in front of students across all sorts of subjects, not just language subjects. And so the question is, how do we bridge that gap, making it easier for teachers who are overworked, time poor, to actually engage with, see these resources and make it easy for them to connect this with what they're trying to do with their students on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's 
thank all the panelists.